Well, look, let's, let's start with Ms. Rata. Um, I know that the government has arranged for two groups of buses to go to Ms. Rata um, uh, in the past, but in the, in the two most recent weeks that I've been here and in the two that I spent here before that, I've repeatedly requested access to Ms. Rata so that we can see with our own eyes what's happening there. Why have we not been taken to Ms. Rata? Well, Jonathan, the security conditions of Masrata are very, um, very difficult. I mean, we did try to take journalists there, and not just twice, by the way, a few times. Um, we did uh, try to help uh, smaller groups of journalists to go there. We tried with the big groups as well. But we're not denying that it's been very difficult for us to secure trips to Masrata. We are not hiding anything, Jonathan. Uh, we are fighting a war against armed gangs that occupied our cities. And we do believe that the world uh, needs to see what is happening in Masrata. But every time we take journalists there, we are faced with fire, with bullets, uh, with attacks by the rebels and the army. We admitted this before. Our army has not been trained to lead and protect journalists into dangerous uh, zones. I realize uh, some journalists we have here are war correspondents and are used to such situations. But unfortunately, our army, our security forces are not trained uh, to lead journalists into, into battle. Uh, but I promise you, as we have tried before, we will try again to lead uh, and take journalists into Masrata. We have helped uh, the Red Cross and the United Nations to go into Masrata and judge and assess the situation there for themselves. We are opening a safe passage, land over land passage to Masrata to help bring in a humanitarian aid. Uh, but what we are faced with there is uh, quite powerful uh, pockets of violence supported by weapons and trainers who come from Benghazi and funded by Qatar and other countries. Uh, and they are not allowing us any, um, any peace there. We did ask officially for a ceasefire in Masrata, specifically in Masrata, so we could help evacuate people, provide them with food, with medicine, uh, fuel, and all the needs. Do you think it's important that journalists go and see what's happening in mm. Misrata? You know, you've always heard me saying that uh, we need experts and we need observers and fact-finding the missions. This is not to belittle the media. I, I am a media guy, and I believe that, yes, journalists should be taken not just into Misrata, but into uh, all the areas in which we have trouble in this country. Uh, I try to negotiate with the army and sometimes uh, they feel they can help us and lead journalists into the battlefield but sometimes they are so terrified of what might happen to these journalists. They say no, we can't take responsibility but I assure you we tr we're trying our best and remember we're not denying that even at you know, uh, peace times we did not have the freedom of press that we were hoping for, let alone war times. We can't change now and have completely free press and free access to everyone. Uh, this was a, a process, Jonathan, that we started in Libya years ago. I joined this process and that was the reason I came back from London, is to have more freedom of the press and help develop uh, our media and institutions. And we were doing quite well. Uh, until the armed rebellion started. Now, actually, we do feel that this uh, progressive process has been taken away from us because of the armed rebellion. Uh, before, it was a peaceful process, gradual, and from within Libya. Now it's violent, it's sudden, and it comes from outside Libya with international agendas. So when I talk to the government and I talk to my colleagues and the army, it's not for them the time now to suddenly have completely free access for the international media. For them, they're not used to that. They are not used, I need to talk to them and negotiate things, but they are not, I assure you, trying to hide anything whatsoever. Masrata is our city. We're concerned for what's happening there, and we want the world to see. Those words, we're not trying to hide anything, are ringing in my ears because I have been held what I, under what I consider to be virtual house arrest in this hotel, unable 
to see mm. anything. What are, you, what, what are you trying to hide? Jonathan, it's not really accurate description, is it? You do go out, and we do take you to we neighborhoods. We only go out to places that you yeah. want us to see, to green demonstrations. Um, not exactly accurate, again, Jonathan. You do go around and drive around with our minders and the interpreters and our drivers. Yes, I know this. As I said, Jonathan, and I did express this before, I don't think it's an ideal situation uh, for journalists who want to really dig deep into the reality of the situation and report on it. I know this. I admit that uh, we are not giving you complete free access. Uh, we have problems with the media. And as I said, we were developing and changing. And now this war comes in and stops and halts everything. We are not free, as Saif al-Gaddafi said we should be, Mm -hmm. to go and talk to people. We, we have not seen mm -hmm. the real Libya. We're stuck in this hotel. What Mr. Saif said was a genuine wish on his side to have free press, free access to journalists everywhere in Libya. But this is not an easy thing to do because you are dealing with both. Uh, the way Libyan institutions are established and the way they treat and, you know, feel towards journalists and also the society itself. You have to remember change doesn't have to happen only in the government institutions but the society itself. People are weary of, of the media, especially international media, and institutions are weary of the media as well. So if I could coordinate something with the army, uh, I might not be able to coordinate uh, that thing with the police force or with the uh, Ministry of Health or with the Ministry of Education or with the Ministry of uh, Oil. Uh, you are asking us to make a fundamental intellectual, political and social change within a very short time. This is very difficult and I see this. I lived in Britain. I know uh, how important freedom of the press is. But I look at my country, at the institutions, at ordinary people, and I know that the change cannot happen from the top. It needs to happen within these institutions of Libya and within the mentality of ordinary people. This takes time. We are fighting to change. We feel this armed rebellion is not helping us change. It made us even more wary of change. We were changing. Libya. Uh, was implementing, uh, was in the process of, of implementing a written constitution, freedom of the press laws, new ones, uh, more transparent political system, anti-corruption laws. We were a little bit on the slow side in the last year or so, that's correct. But we were moving forward, no doubt about this. Now war, you can't change during the time of war because at the time of war, people are scared, they are afraid, they are not sure about things, they prefer to take a step back and watch. So I understand when uh, Libyan institutions and ordinary people say to me, no, we can't have the media, well, I don't want to receive the media, stop the media. I don't agree, but I know why they are saying that. As a matter of fact, Jonathan, yeah. you say this, um, when we agreed to the African roadmap, it includes um, a transitional period in which we are hoping that uh, such uh, progressive changes would be implemented, especially freedom of the press. We are hoping then people will be relaxed, peace will be established around the country, national dialogue, uh, you know, taking a place, and then people will feel happy about uh, freedom of the press and inviting international media. But before that, it's a very hard job for me as the government spokesperson and the coordinator of the Foreign Press Center here at Rexos. Do you see, do you see what I'm, where I'm going? I agree, you see, I'm agreeing with you. Uh, but at the same time, I would like you to understand, you can't make these radical changes at a time of war when people are afraid, suspicious, and they'd rather take a step back and be cautious than adventure, if you like. Look, I mean, that answer preempted one of the things I was going to ask you about all those years you spent in the UK at Exeter <coughs> University going on to do, uh, you know, the media studies doctorate um, and, and, you know, those 15 years of being mm. um, in, 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 a, in a democratic society with total press freedom. Um, 
you know, it, it must have come as a bit of a shock to you to not only arrive in a country where those mm. institutions are, in a sense, well, mm. are, are deeply repressive, but with your own desire, as you say, to, to see things open up, to now, to now be confronted with all these journalists mm. who are going completely stir-crazy in here, <laughs> unable... I mean, how does that make you feel? <clears throat> well, Jonathan, to start with, um, I love many things about Britain, and I think it's a progressive society, but I'm also critical about things there. I know how important capital in Britain is, and I know how big corporations control many things in the country, and I, you know, I'm not, I do not accept everything that takes place in Britain, but in, in, in essence, I think it's a free society, it's democratic society, and it allows human beings to be creative. We need to establish similar things in Libya. And that was the very reason I came back a year ago to join this process. And the but did you not feel like throwing the towel in now that you've seen what it's like? No, actually, if I'm angry, Jonathan, I'm angry at the armed rebellion, not the government. Because the only guilt for me the only, the only, the only uh, mistake the Libyan government committed is uh, the slow rhythm of change that, um, that uh, dominated the Libyan scene in the last year. From outside, it looked like zero. Not really, no. Believe me, we started uh, to have uh, <clears throat> more room for criticism. I was heading a center, a media center, uh, that owned newspapers, magazines, TV stations, radio stations, websites. And when I, when I first came, I noticed the change immediately. We were allowed to talk. We were allowed to criticize. We were allowed to suggest uh, change, to propose a different society. And many hundreds of writers, journalists, artists were really happy that this was the case. Um, Last year, for example, I helped produce uh, 25 plays, more than 50 songs, uh, 40 exhibitions for photography and painting. Uh, we printed many books, published many books. You know, we, we are doing quite well, and people were critical of the government, of the state, of the situation Libya was in. They were proposing ideas for change. Uh, they were complaining about the slow rhythm of change. But we were all hopeful and feeling that there was something in the air. We did not expect an armed rebellion. Now we are uh, you know, threatened with a civil war, uh, military, uh, foreign military intervention, the total collapse of the country. It's for us very sad. I would love, I would love to deal. For me, it's easier to deal with the slow rhythm than to deal with this situation. Well, look, what, one of the experiences that I had, which has really <clears throat> stayed with me, <clears throat> was, um, was when that woman, Aman al Abedi, burst into our hotel here yeah. um, and uh, told a very tragic story of what had happened to her. Mm. Um, and, you know, in, in front of all the international journalists, that, you know, she was, they attempted to silence her. Mm. Uh, uh, it, it looked like a barroom brawl. I was punched in the face myself. Yeah. Other journalists were thrown around. Mm. Um, you know, what, 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 we weren't even allowed to talk to this woman. What, what, what do you make of her story and, and, and you know, wh where is she now? Well, um, I made enough comments on uh, Iman al Obeidi's story. Um, I think she's, um, she was a woman who maybe went through a trauma and she felt that she needed to make it as big as possible, maybe possibly political. I mean, she claims that she was kidnapped and raped. Um, this happens anywhere in the world. She should have gone to a police station, to the court, and uh, she should have um, you know, followed the course of justice. Uh, the, she chose to go political with this. I cannot find any political elements in her story whatsoever. But before, I do before not, we knew I do anything not, about yeah. it, you, you were, no, you no, were no, saying I absolutely, that she, she was drunk, Jonathan, I, I talked to you, I talked to you, I said two things. First of all, we cannot get into the details of her story because we are a very conservative society.